All right, we've been meaning to do this for a long time. Uh, we're basically going to talk about baby water monitors, and we're also going to talk about just the idea of monitors and actually maybe lizards. And uh, I have some tips. I'm going to talk about basic care, and uh, more importantly, about the uh, psychological dynamics of these little guys. And it's very important to think like a lizard. Don't think of it as you want it to be. You need to see it as it is. Yep, so these guys are hatching today. So if we, we talk about the very beginning, uh, so it takes six to seven months to hatch a water monitor. And uh, a lot of times people see these big, beautiful water monitors that people have pet, as pets and they just like, wow, they're really enamored with like this urban dinosaur and this wonderful, big pet, crazy reptile. And they're like, that's what I want. They then will go out, try to go to a pet store, go to a reptile show if we ever have them again. And they want to get these uh, little water monitors. And essentially what they see, they maybe see a uh, water monitor for like $250, $300. Okay, these are wild caught water monitors. This is not the same thing as captive bred water monitors. And they might come in, they might say that they're farmed or they're ranched or whatever. None of that is actually accurate. To actually breed a water monitor takes a lot of uh, energy get your setups right. Certainly to breed them with any kind of consistency, it really takes a lot. So, uh, you know, people that are breeding, certainly in the States, there's not many. My buddy over in Bali, Danny Gorman, he breeds water monitors and he's, he's got it dialed in. He's got beautiful water monitors. But somebody like him will tell you how, how involved and what you have to actually have to do. So I want you to realize, so if you go and get a little $250, $350 little water monitor, you will often run into a lot of problems. And their socialization is often in question, but uh, more importantly, their health. These are uh, pet ivory dragons. So this is, uh, we have this uh, ivory water monitor that uh, we keep and breed. And thank goodness for my buddy, Andre. I have been able to start making these. So this is, uh, will be a heterozygous for ivory. And uh, like I said, six or seven months. And it's very, very hard to actually hatch these guys if you don't know what you're doing and certainly breeding them. So we're gonna go over some of the basics. Here's some other water monitors that just hatched. And the thing you wanna note, when water monitors are first just hatched, we'll put away two. Go ahead. Sure. When they're first hatched, they are convinced Everything, everybody wants to eat them because they're literally at the bottom of the food chain. So in the wild, they'd be subject to uh, fish eating them, frogs eating them, certainly raptors, wading birds, basically everything. Other water monitors, other monitors are going to want to eat these. So the first thing is, this is a clean canvas. So somebody like me that breeds these, it's very important right off the bat that I do certain things and uh, basically what I have to do is I have to convince these animals that I'm not going to kill them. So they come out of the egg and they will bite and lose their minds and poop and whatever and uh, it is my job to convince this animal otherwise. So this animal right here is very very reactive. So black dragons, these are a Khomeini bloodline these tend to be uh, very unsure of themselves and very, very reactive. This is a black dragon that's been sitting in soak, so it's a little bit worried, but no, no fear of, of biting or anything like that. So what I'm gonna do, so at this point, there's a big camera staring at him in my eye. So what we're gonna do, so what we're doing right now is we're giving this guy a chance for his brain to, to click in. And often this occurs within moments. Very, very important for this guy to be able to assess the situation, take it in. If I don't actually give this animal that chance to actually do that, I'll constantly get it in, I need to get away, I need to get away, I'm in a fear mode, and I'm not working within thinking modes. I always talk about in my other videos, when I talk about reptiles, they live in modes. We're interested in working with them when they're in the thinking mode. And that is when they're expressing a certain level of trust for you, so your handling without restraining is uh, basically working around that little mindset of this animal. So you have a couple things to consider. You have the health of this animal, 
as far as when you first get your animal, are you going to get a healthy one? And the second thing is, what's the mindset like? So I could get an animal with a crazy mindset where it fears you and is distrustful and constantly wants to get away and you set it up incorrectly in the aspect that you don't meet the, the mental aspects that the animal needs and maybe all you're doing is managing temperatures, water, and basic husbandry. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna have an animal that's living in a high stress environment that is quite un unwilling to actually trust you. And the trick is to get something like this to be sweet doesn't want to bite, is uh, interested in being with you, and uh, then that way you can have a very, very friendly, uh, wonderful social pet. So this one right here, we'll just, he's, he's already been worked over pretty heavily. So what I need to do is, he's, he's gonna kind of just go into this little bit of a running mode, so I'll actually put him away, because I want to end this on a positive note, and this is all about threads of trust. There we go. We got a tongue on the side of the mouth, the nice, Tongue flicks like that, beautiful. Thinking mode, everything great. Licking the tongue down the side of the mouth is great too. If uh, this guy just wants to dash away or if he doesn't flick his tongue, it basically means he's very fearful and he's just looking for his way to escape. So if I want to get this guy to slow down. Okay, here's a little baby T positive, a bind a water monitor. So this is Tyrosin positive. So a, a, like a classic albino ball python, tyrosine T negative. This is a T positive. So this guy has a little bit of melanin. It's born with a bit of melanin. As it grows, all the melanin goes away. And then essentially it looks very much like my T negatives. Uh, but that's a beautiful, beautiful animal. And so uh, we've been breeding water monitors for so long now. My original stock came from the wild and uh, I have fifth generation, and I think we're approaching sixth generation babies. So that means five to six times removed from the wild. And we often just, you know, we're working with our animals, so our gene stock is wonderful, uh, very, very sweet, and we keep breeding those and using that as our gene stock. And it seems uh, we end up just having these very, very uh, sweet, um, nearly domestic type animals in some cases but a little guy like this confidence blinking looking around not dashing around is wonderful not scared of me because if I have a pet and it constantly thinks I'm going to eat it um, I'm gonna put a, a bunch of negative uh, energy with my presence or for that animal so what it's going to do is gonna to want to hide and an animal that's hiding all the time certainly um, defeats the reason why we actually keep these animals. And if this animal feels like the monster in the room, I need to hide, then it's, it's literally, it literally fears you and we, we need to basically address that. So we have to basically teach this animal to trust you. And they're so smart. Once I socialize them and make them wonderful, they really do trust you, they recognize you, they know your voice. They know your smell. They know everything about you. And very quickly, like a stranger could walk by and within just a second or seconds, they can assess the situation and they can uh, address if that is something they need to be afraid of. And remember, this is what nature did and what nature intended. This little animal is constantly looking at any kind of thing, uh, uh, assessing it as a danger. So they're looking for movement. They're looking for any would-be predators or any of that, and so, but in a home situation or in captivity, we don't really have all those predatory, you know, situations. So we have to basically kind of defeat all that and teach them to trust people and that people are actually a good thing. All right, so when we're setting up Varana species monitors, it's imperative we choose the correct housing for the instance and the size of the animal. So a couple of these things are, they're, there are aspects that some people just don't seem to understand, and I want to break this down. I've been keeping monitors for a long time, and I have some understanding of their psyche. And what you need to do is you need to keep them addressing their fears and their basic needs. So if I start with a baby water monitor, there's obviously a multitude of different kind of cages. But if you look at the footprint, which is 30 inches by 12 inches, uh, this is a fine footprint for a baby water monitor. And uh, then as the keeper, it is now my job to basically provide the correct parameters, which is heating, 
uh, bedding, uh, places to hide, humidity, cleanliness of water, proper food items, and managing the environment of that animal. And if I fail to do that, what I'm going to have pretty quickly is a stressed out monitor that is likely to die. So right here, we're starting with the 20 long, but something of the size. Very important. Don't make the cage too big. The reason is when you put this animal into an environment, it needs to feel safe. If I give this, let's say a 55 gallon tank, which is 48 inches by 12 inches, it's a much larger uh, environment. So that little guy could get in there and that room could cause it stress because it's worried about finding a place to hide. And what it'll often do is we'll dash around and do all that. And then as they start dashing around, they start losing it. They can't collect their, their thoughts and uh, they'll go into a fear mode. And sometimes they click into that fear mode. And every time you do that, that causes uh, more destruction of the relationship you trying to have with that animal or you would have with that animal. So I like a smaller, secure type environment that still gives the, the range where it can have a hot area of 120 to 130 degree for a hot spot in a cooler area in the low 80s. And this type of uh, situation will work with many, many Asian monitor species. So it could be a blue tail, it could be a peach throat, it could be a Timor monitor, this could be a baby Nile monitor, this could be a baby Savannah monitor, this could be a uh, Ackies. So with water monitors, very, very important about heat. So if I have a 20 long, I have a screen top on that, and then I would use something like a dome lid. This is a double dome lid. And what's really nice about this, and it's very important, when you buy something like this, a big dome with a porcelain fixture versus a plastic fixture is better. It's gonna prolong the life of the bulb. And what I want you to do is when you put that dome on, on your screen top, I want you to fix it. So take some wire and put it through the screen top and put it into the dome or fasten that dome so it doesn't fall over because we don't want fires. So with something like this, I will make that with uh, love. I mean, Zoom Ed makes so many great things, but a power sun is excellent because this is UVA and UVB. So UVA is essentially assessing the, the infrared, the heat signature and the projection of that bulb. We use flood lamps. We do not use spot lamps. Spot lamps will often focus that infrared A energy into such a small, little area that it actually could cause burn. So if that animal lives in a colder house and we focus this energy, it could actually cause burns on the animal's back. So we use flood lamps. UVB is basically to simulate the spectrum of natural sunlight. And that sunlight, uh, the infrared spectrum is uh, perfect for reptiles and uh, allows these animals to elevate their D3 levels and D3 hormone levels are essential for that animal to pull calcium and other uh, minerals and nutrients from their diet so they don't have something called metabolic bone disease. And it's also really good for their mental psyche. Heating pad. So for a 20 long, this size heating pad or a little bit you know, bigger, it really depends on what is your average room temperature at your house. But we want a heating pad and we want a place for the animal to hide at night that's gonna attract him to sit on the heating pad. What the heating pad is gonna do is make sure that we still have the temperatures where the animal can digest. So if that animal eats uh, you know, some uh, defrosted rodents, eggs, any kind of uh, slightly cooked meat, insects, it needs to digest its food. So if that animal actually drops below 80 degrees, that uh, food item can actually start to rot in that animal's gut, and then we start having all sorts of problems. And these are what kill your baby monitor. Very, very important, basking. So basking, I wanna create a nice larger area where I aim my power sun, my flood lamp. What's nice about this, you can use a flood lamp and a full spectrum power compact, ZoomEd uh, 10.0. So the, the dual uh, lamp setup right here is actually really good for these, these monitors. But now we're taking this energy and we need to put it down on something. I like things like tile and slate or something like that that actually will heat up and actually will dissipate the heat. So if I aim the, the light right in the center, this will naturally be the hottest point. But as you start going towards the edge, the temperature goes down. And then this little monitor is gonna come over here and we'll grab one. 
and what he's going to do when he thermoregulates, he'll sit here and uh, find out where the temperature is that he likes so he gets his body temperature and his core temperature to a place that uh, allows his metabolism to function and his immune response. And we basically want to keep this guy very happy. And so I'm always shooting for 120, 130 degree hotspot, ambient temperatures in the cage, maybe in the lower 80s. Uh, certainly a heating pad overnight if your room is not very warm. Uh, we also want to worry about our uh, humidity. And you can cover up some of the screen with a piece of plastic. Certainly don't get yourself in any kind of flammable situation. And what you want to do is you want to retain some of that humidity in the cage. If you make it too humid, you're going to start having uh, bacterial and fungal uh, lesions, which will kill these guys real quick. So I like uh, humidity 60 to 70%, which is adequate. I like a very shallow uh, water basin. And generally with water monitors, they often uh, defecate in the water dish. So changing them daily is really important. And make sure you don't have any of that bacterial slime in there. So I use a little bit of uh, dishwashing detergent and a little bit of uh, bleach in that solution and really give that uh, water dish a good cleaning and that way you don't have any uh, high levels of bacteria. So here we have a very uh, classic water monitor that we produce. Very, very sweet. Notice the long tongue flicks. This guy's taking it all in. He's really not worried at all. And this is what we're all about. This is a big difference from the imported wild caught animals that we often see. Sometimes you can actually get a good imported animal and there's nothing wrong with that at all. And especially if sometimes you find ones that are even somebody's already tamed or socialized. That's a winner. So that's that's not a bad thing. But generally most imported uh, water monitors that come in under the uh, illusion that they're farmed or they're captive bred over there, they'll uh, come in and have a really good parasite load. They'll ha often have uh, significant respiratory problems. If you see your monitor shutting his eyes, you see bubbles coming out of the nostrils, puffing in the throat, opening the mouth, clicking, gasping, skinniness, see a nice tail base like that, nice and fat. You really want these guys to uh, be as healthy as possible. Parasites will definitely uh, help take these guys down. They can have a primary uh, parasitic load, including flagellates, which is protozoa, which can actually uh, ultimately cause a respiratory infection. They'll dehydrate really quick. So uh, you want to make sure shallow water, proper temperatures are really critical, and we want to uh, address and manage the fear and the trust of these animals. So one good trick, we have the basking platform. Underneath it, I have a spacer. And this is actually an arboreal perch, which I use for like baby uh, uh, arboreals, like emerald tree boas, Amazon tree boas, Amazon basins, uh, green tree pythons. And what's really nice about this, if I actually take this, this is heating up. I have the light there, but I still have a place where the animal is attracted to go underneath there, and it can hide. So for substrate, uh, my, my substrates are pretty basic. Uh, I often really like newspaper. Newspaper is great. Uh, I can clean it, and it requires a little bit more cleaning. Uh, cypress mulch, like this, is great. You want to prevent it from getting too wet. Slightly damp, like you, you would find in the forest, is fine. Uh, you can also use uh, cocoa peat with some sand. Don't make it too wet. These guys, even though they're called water monitors, they need to dry out. And certainly with all monitor species, unless we're dealing with like Borneo earless lizards and maybe Merton's water monitors, and even they need to dry out too. These need to be able to bask. They get significantly hot. They'll dry out. That helps knock back the bacteria and the fungus that they will naturally get in a wet environment. So don't have that uh, cage all dank. I don't want to see any precipitation of water in the cage. I don't want to see a lot of uh, water drops or anything like that. There needs to be some ventilation. It's very important. All right, so now we want to address some of the mindset of these little guys. So we're going to put some fixtures in the cages. Uh, if I allow these guys to hide too much, so whenever I enter the room, they immediately go and hide, and that's because they're fearful of you. If I allow too much of that, I start running into problems because the animal now learns that every time I come in the room, it needs to hide so it feels safe. So we do a whole thing. We do videos on building trust. And what we do is we have small, short episodes of positive interaction with these animals 
without causing the animal to lose its mind and become really fearful of you. And that basically means going into the animal's environment, uh, not scaring it, and even if your experience is only 10 seconds and you just you go in there and you show them that you're not going to hurt it, if you enter the environment, you don't scare it, but you get it so it's aware of you and then you leave the situation, that is a thread and collectively threads build a rope. So we want to have positive reinforcement and this is really a, a basic critical thing uh, with most animal management and developing a relationship and a rapport with them. And I just learned to just do this. This was really good. What this animal just did, it just set back, licked side, sideways. And we want, what we want to do is whenever we're interacting with animals, we want the animal to pause for a second, take it in, and you'll see it, what I'm talking about. He just did that. And uh, it means that my brain's working, everything's okay. Because the animal has assessed the situation. If the animal is constantly trying to scoot away, you, you basically you have this fear mode, and if I'm not careful, I can ruin that. So the cage, the cage setting it up higher in the room as opposed to lower. If I'm towering over the animal, I'm causing stress. If I'm looking down, these animals are always aware and very keen on your eyesight and the position of your eyes. To bring down their stress, you can do this. So once you have an animal like this that's uh, knows you and you have a good relationship, I often recommend getting like a cat tree and put a cat tree someplace in your room where you're interacting and you can let your monitor go and sit there. And that is actually, that works really good because even if you're not touching the animal or interacting with the animal, the animal can look down at you because basically I want to have relationships with my monitors where they actually can get down on the floor, they can walk around and just because they're on the floor doesn't mean they, they're trying to get away from you. Often they'll just be exploring. So positioning of the cage is important. No dogs, cats running by it, sitting on the screen top. Uh, often when you're interacting with uh, one of these little guys and you're, you're basically developing a relationship, if somebody enters a room or comes around a corner really quick, that can actually spook you guys because they're really intuitive and they're very, very aware. So you always want to be very, very careful. So when they're little, they're imprinted with the idea that you want to eat them. And so what we're doing is reprogramming this carnivore's little mind. You're so cute. But you see, these guys have like really no fear. This is all just curiosity. So if I give these guys something that they feel very uh, confident about being on, see, very inquisitive, just nose pointed down, a lot of tongue flicking, blinking. This is all really good. Now look at this. See right here? This is, they don't care anything because we've been imprinting ourselves on them and teaching them there's no need to fear us. So basically uh, what I want my monitors to do is uh, appreciate humans as fun and something they want to socialize. We're actually, my monitors actually crave to come out and interact with people because they're so highly intelligent. So you may want to do, uh, you may want to cover part of the cage with paper. You want to keep its cage as a safe zone and you want to prevent things from scaring it. Sometimes you can put a little piece of PVC, it's a tube that you easily can get the monitor out of as opposed to you know some of these fixtures where they get in there and you can't get them out. You want easy access. Another thing I do is I do a green vinyl coated wire. I make ramps to the water dish, ramps up to branches, and I make tubes. So the animal will actually crawl inside the tube. You can still see it, but it feels secure. And if you look at some of my other videos, I go over that. Make sure you look through some of our older videos for some of the literal aspects of husbandry, like how we're feeding these guys, some of the food choices we do. This is more like just the appreciation of these animals going through some of the elements, some of the aspects of these, and I'll pull out one more. See it's right there? That's mm -hmm. key. See that right there? Okay, so what that animal did, it paused, assessed, and then went back to what it was doing. It's very, very important to read the language of these animals. And remember, modes. We want to work in thinking mode. This little black dragon is taking it all in, assessing, and we're making some headway. Like and subscribe to uh, New England Reptile on Facebook. Of course, follow us on YouTube. And if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. We really appreciate it. And we're striving to give you good content, interesting content that you don't find all over the internet 
Donnie's working very, very hard for our Twitch uh, TV audience, and that audience is growing. And uh, also make sure you follow me on Evil Morph God on Instagram, as well as Noon Reptile on Instagram. And uh, as always, we appreciate your support. And like and subscribe and make some noise because we want to hear from you. I gotta turn my camera on, dude. You didn't turn your camera on!